Hi class and welcome to chapter 20. Um, chapter 20 is a lot about the body systems and how the body is organized. I really like this chapter because I'm primarily an anatomy and physiology instructor. Um, so we're going to kind of be focusing on the anatomy and physiology parts of chapter 20, um, how the body is organized and the different body systems. So first we'll talk about the structure and organization of the animal body, which includes humans. Anatomy is the study of the form of an organism structures and physiology is the study of function of those structures. And animals consist of what we call a hierarchy of levels of organization where tissues are in integrated groups of similar cells that perform a common function. Organs perform a specific task and consist of two or more tissues and organ systems consist of multiple organs that together perform a vital body function. So if we look at how an animal is organized, we have the cellular level, the muscle level, the tissue level of muscle, muscle tissue, the organ level of the heart, and then the organs will make up organ systems such as the circulatory system and all the different uh, organ systems make up the organism where you have many organ systems functioning together. Tissues are an integrated group of similar cells that perform a common function and they will combine to form organs. So we'll start at the tissue level and all animals have four main categories of tissue, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. The epithelial tissues are sheets of closely packed cells that cover all body surfaces and line internal organs and cavities. And epithelial tissues are named according to the number of layers they have of cells and also the shape of the cells on their apical or exposed surface. Epithelial cells come in three shapes that we'll talk about. Here is a simple squamous epithelium. It's a single layer, so it's a single a simple layer, and squamous means flat cells. Stratified squamous epithelium um, is multiple layers of those flat squamous cells, and the arrows are showing where in the body you can find these types of tissues. Simple cuboidal um, epithelium is a single layer of cuboid-shaped cells, and simple columnar epithelium is a single layer of column-shaped cells. So here's simple squamous epithelium, um, a single layer of those flat squamous shell cells. And the apical surface is always the exposed surface. And the basal surface, which is not shown here, is always the part that's attached to the underlying tissue layer. Here's simple cuboidal epithelium, a single layer of cube-shaped cells. For example, these cells are arranged in a circle that make up like a tube-like structure. So you'll find these in your kidneys. Simple columnar epithelium is a single layer of column-shaped cells. Stratified squamous is multiple layer, layers of those flat-type cells. Keep wanting to say shells, excuse me. And then connective tissue is the second type of tissue in the body. This consists of a sparse population, so fewer cells scattered throughout what we call an extracellular matrix. The cells produce and secrete the matrix, which usually consists of a web of fibers embedded in a liquid, jelly, or solid. And these are the six major types of connective tissue that you can see there. Um, blood also qualifies as a type of connective tissue because it's made up of um, extracellular matrix, which is your plasma. So here are the different types of connective tissue. It's the most diverse uh, tissue type in the body because it's, um, it, it contains bone, cartilage, blood, um, adipose, so we'll talk about these uh, different types of connective tissue now, but it's the most diverse and widely distributed tissue in the body. So here's um, the first type of connective tissue. This is loose connective tissue. It's found underneath the skin. You can see the cell nucleus. You can see um, strands of collagen and elastic fibers. Here's the fibrous connective tissue, um, often forming a tendon. So you'll see kind of tightly packed collagen fibers. So it um, lends strength to this type of connective tissue, which forms your tendons, which will connect uh, bone to muscle. Here's adipose tissue, which um, is filled with fat. So we have adipocytes, which are fat cells. It looks like they're just empty white spaces, but those are actually fat droplets that are filling up the cells. Here's cartilage. Um, and cartilage forming cells within the matrix. So cartilage is found at the ends of your bone. 
uh, to keep them nice and smooth as they articulate or touch other bones. And here is what bone looks like underneath a microscope. It's really similar kind of, um, it might look like tree rings that you would say, see if you were to cut a tree um, transversely, this is bone. Here's blood. So you can see red blood cells, um, white blood cells, and then the plasma is the connective tissue surrounding the blood cells. Then the third type of tissue is muscle tissue. It's the most abundant tissue in animals. Um, Muscle tissue can be skeletal muscle causing voluntary movements, cardiac muscle, which will pump the blood, and smooth muscle that moves walls of internal organs, such as the intestines. Um, cramps felt during menstruation are caused by an involuntary contraction of smooth muscle of the uterus. So here are the different types of muscle. Skeletal muscle is found in all of your muscles to help your body move. Um, cardiac muscle is found in your heart to pump blood and smooth muscle is found in most of the walls of your internal organs like your intestines, stomach, uterus, bladder. So here's skeletal muscle, you can see the nuclei, you can see the striation, so it kind of looks like zebra stripes, so this is skeletal muscle. Here's cardiac muscle, um, there's junctions which are these darker lines that connect um, the cardiac muscle cells together. And then here's smooth muscle. You can see the muscle fibers, the nucleus of the smooth muscle. Then nervous tissue uh, senses stimuli and rapidly transmits information. The neurons carry signals by conducting electrical impulses. Other cells in nervous tissue will insulate axons, nourish their neurons and regulate the fluid around the neurons. How does the long length of some axons relate to the function of a neuron? Um, the longer the axon, just it will go directly to the place that it will control. So here's a look at a neuron. So the cell body, the axon, and then the dendrite. So these are parts of the neuron. The dendrites receive stimulation or nervous impulses from other axons. The cell body kind of integrates and processes those um, nervous stimuli, stimulations, and then the axon continues the signal. Um, to connect to other nerve cells. So then organs and organ systems, each tissue performs a specific function, for example. So your small intestine is lined by what we call columnar epithelium um, that has two layers of smooth muscle that helps to propel food in the small intestine. And the inner surface of the small intestine has many finger-like projections that increase the surface area for absorption. Explain why a disease that damages connective tissue can impair most of the body's organs. And that's because connective tissue is so diverse that it will, um, it, it, can, it is very far reaching. So a disease that affects connective tissue will probably affect many organs. So here's the tissue layers in the walls of the small intestine, for example. So it's made of um, muscle tissue that will help to kind of propel food along and also these villi or little out pocketings where food will get absorbed. Bioengineers are seeking ways to repair or replace damaged tissues and organs. Uh, new tissues and organs are being grown on a scaffold of connective tissue from the donated organ. And other research is using 3D printers to create layers of cells resembling the structure of organs. And this is a look at a decellularized pig heart, um, which is kind of cool to see and how we can use a pig heart, for example, to grow more tissue for a human or just as a general form um, model for what we can use. So then we'll look at organ systems that work together to perform life's functions. The ability to carry out life's functions is a result of the emergent properties stemming from the organization, interaction and coordination of all the body's organ systems working together. The circulatory system, for example, delivers oxygen and nutrients to body cells and transports carbon dioxide to the lungs and metabolic wastes to the kidneys. The respiratory system will exchange gases with the environment, supplying blood with oxygen and disposing or getting rid of carbon dioxide as you exhale. So here's a look at the human organ systems and their components. So you should be really familiar with um, the 11 different organ systems of um, the body and the general function of each. So you should know the general function of each. The integumentary system protects. Um, it consists of your hair, skin, and nails. The muscular system moves the body, maintains posture, and produces heat. 
The skeletal system supports and protects. And the urinary system removes waste products. It also regulates the chemical makeup, pH, and water balance of the blood. And the digestive system ingests and digests food, absorbs nutrients, and eliminates wastes. The endocrine system is really important for the distribution of hormones that controls basically all of your body's functions. The lymphatic and immune system is important for the body's defense system. The nervous system is important in terms of your brain, spinal cord, nerves, um, in terms of controlling all the other systems. And the reproductive system, males and females, important for continuing on life. So the next couple of slides take you through each organ system and a general description of each that you should know. So review these slides on your own so you know the differences between the integumentary system, the skeletal system, the muscular system, the urinary system and digestive system. They all, again, work together to perform life's functions. Uh, the endocrine system maintains an internal steady state, which we call homeostasis using hormones the lymphatic system and immune system, the nervous system, the reproductive system, and a couple checkpoint questions. We'll go a little bit more. Here's a section of your skin, the major organ of the integumentary system. It helps to protect, um, dissipate heat, control body temperature. Then we'll talk a little bit about scientific thinking and how we create well-designed experiments that help answer scientific questions. So for example, to make an informed decision and behave as a responsible consumer, so everyone should do this, not just people who are going into healthcare-related fields, we always need to evaluate information as scientists do. We can examine one variable at a time, including a randomized control, and control for bias in data interpretation or hallmarks of well-designed experiments. So for example, this is anatomy of a pupil and we all probably have experienced pupils and to understand the anatomy of the pupil and to make an informed decision, we need to learn a little bit about the science behind it. Here's the reduction in pimples before and after a laser therapy treatment in an uncontrolled study. So this, the y-axis shows the average number of pimples before laser therapy, after the first, second, and third treatment. So it's showing that with laser therapy, um, the number of pimples is decreasing. So the ability to read graphs like this is important um, in order to just function in society and to use what scientists use in order to help better your life and the lives of your family members. Here's the reduction in a subtype of pimple before and after laser therapy in a control randomized single blind study. So here's the average number of red pimples before laser therapy, four weeks after the third treatment, and 10 weeks after the third treatment. Um, they used a control, meaning they only treated one side of the face. So the treated side of the face is in dark blue and the untreated side of the face is in light blue. And it's always good to have a control, meaning an untreated side of the face, to always have something to compare it to. Why was it important for the scientists um, counting the pimples to be blind to which side of the face was treated? So what that means is the scientists didn't know which side of the face was being treated. And that's just important so that the scientist doesn't have a bias, meaning the scientist will say, well, of course, this side of the face will have less uh, because it was the side that was treated. Well, the scientists didn't know which side was treated, and that gives a more honest study and a more honest result. The external and internal regulation and exchange is important. Um, every organism is an open system that must exchange matter and energy with the environment and surroundings. Cells in small and flat animals can exchange materials directly with the environment, but complex animals like humans have specialized internal structures that increase the surface area. And the exchange of materials between the blood and body cells takes place through what we call the interstitial fluid. So here's a look at a schematic representation showing the indirect exchange between the environment and the cells of a complex animal. So for example, food enters our mouth and exits out of the anus. And between that, the nutrients that are absorbed from the food get sent into the circulatory system, so your blood. Those nutrients then get sent throughout the blood um, to all the cells that need it. So your cells in your body take in glucose and they create energy or ATP from the glucose. 
carbon dioxide gets sent out as a waste product, we exhale carbon dioxide. Oxygen is sent in through your lungs to the blood because oxygen is needed to create energy together with glucose. And this balance showing the interstitial fluid and the body cells is kind of the mediator, the in-between step going from blood to your body cells. Everything travels through what we call interstitial fluid, which is the fluid outside of the cells and outside of your arteries. The urinary system then takes up any waste products that are created from cellular metabolism and will exit out uh, the waste products as urine. Here's a look at a model of the finely branched air tubes of the lungs and blood vessels are in red of the human lung. So air oxygen travels within the lungs through these tiny little branches. And the, um, you have blood vessels that surround your lungs that pick up that oxygen that you breathe in. How do the structures of the lungs, small intestines and kidneys relate to the function of exchange with the environment? They're all important because they all have contact with either oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products, um, absorption of nutrients with digestion. You answered this question in our lab um, that we talked about cellular respiration and how all of these organ systems are important for that. Animals can regulate their internal environment and conditions often fluctuate widely in the external environment, but homeostatic mechanisms regulate internal conditions resulting in much smaller changes in the animal's internal environment. A control mechanism that reverses a change in the internal environment back to normal is called negative feedback. And a control mechanism that will amplify a change is called positive feedback. And a good example of this is a model of internal temperature homeostasis in a snowy owl. So there's large fluctuations in the external environment between negative 30 and 10 degrees Celsius but the internal environment of that owl through homeostatic mechanisms keeps the internal environment of that owl between 38 degrees and 40 degrees Celsius. So that's what our body does. Even with extreme changes in temperature, our body keeps our internal temperature um, at a range of normal. What are some ways in which the circulatory system contributes to homeostasis? Well, your circulatory system um, consists of your heart and blood vessels and it will control how quickly blood gets pumped to other parts of the body. Um, your blood also um, helps to control the temperature as well in the body. Control systems will detect change and direct a response. So for example, the negative feedback mechanism will keep an internal variable steady and permit only small fluctuations around a set point. Some portable heaters do not have thermostats and explain the consequence of turning one on in a room. Um, if it doesn't have a thermostat, it'll just main, stay on and it could catch fire. So here's a look at the feedback control of body temperature. So a temperature increases above set point, your brain senses that and your blood vessels in the skin will dilate. You will also start sweating to try to decrease the temperature back to normal. If the temperature falls below set point, the brain, the hypothalamus will activate warming mechanisms where the blood vessels will constrict to try to minimize heat loss. And also your skeletal muscles will contract by shivering to try to generate heat, bringing the temperature back to normal. And this is just the feedback control body temperature part one and part two. This is a great negative feedback animation that I would encourage you guys to watch and positive feedback mechanism. So again, use these final slides of the PowerPoint to review what you should have um, learned here are just um, some kind of future careers. If you're interested in this chapter, some future careers that kind of we discussed and that would use the things discussed. Two cell layers um, showing the difference of epithelial layers in an internal organ. Here's a really good review of the function and structure and examples of the different uh, four tissues in the body. Here's a good um, kind of review of labeling. This is showing an intestine. You can go back in the slide to label these. And that takes us through chapter 20. Thanks for listening, guys.